topic that um, that we have as a uh, as a team, I'm very delighted. I'll we'll introduce the uh, the panel here in, sec in a second. Is embracing the personalized consumer, the entertainment, technology, and commerce from the digital home to the mobile platform, and. Fundamentally, uh, what we're trying to do here is to address this, uh, this question that says the consumer really lives in uh, three different media environments uh, today. They live in the mobile environment, they live in the work environment, and they live in the uh, home environment. And of course, the discussion is always that the consumer wants to move seamlessly between these uh, environments and be able to have their content anytime, any place, anywhere. And, um, so we're going we're gonna to kind of explore that uh, question on this, uh, this panel. And uh, we're lucky to have kind of a very nice mix of, uh, of people here uh, with me to, uh, to help in that. So what I'd like to do is just uh, turn it over to uh, each member of the, of the panel here to introduce themselves and tell us about your background. Uh, Debbie, you want to start? Hi. Um, I'm Debbie Solomon, and I'm Executive Research Director at Mindshare. Mindshare is a an advertising agency, a media agency. We're one of the largest in the world. And uh, my role at Mindshare is uh, consumer insights. So I'm here on this panel representing the voice of the consumer. My name is John Morrow, and I'm with uh, Cisco. I'm the uh, Vice President of Strategy and Business Development for what's known as the Video Technology Group, uh, formerly the business known as Scientific Atlanta. And so, uh, for those of you who don't know, the former company Scientific Atlanta, we make set-top boxes, among other things, but that's certainly what we're most well-known for. And uh, I'm excited about being a part of this panel, honored to, to be among the others and uh, talk about the connected life. So I look forward to it. Hi, uh, I'm Marty Stein. I'm a marketing director for, our, for Motorola's uh, IP Video Solutions Group. Uh, and we, we make set-tops also. Uh, and that's probably Mo Motorola's least known product. <laughs> so, so a nice balance there. So uh, we're, we're primarily involved with, the, our group is primarily involved with the new uh, set tops for, that are IP compatible or IPTV set tops and all of the infrastructure equipment that goes along with that. And of course we're also involved with uh, the, the whole issue of uh, interoperability between that and our mobile platforms or any mobile platform and personal media players as you know, as people want to uh, move content more and more outside uh, the living room, so that that's what we're up to. Hi, I'm Topper Winslow. I'm responsible for sales marketing and BD at Choice Stream. Uh, unlike the previous two, we do not make set tops, although we aspire to make them more useful to consumers. Uh, Choice Stream's in the business of personalization. We're a recommendation engine that powers a lot of uh, uh, online services, and by online, I'm not meaning just sort of web-based, but also uh, mobile and set-top. Um, folks like Comcast, AT&T, DirecTV, Echo Star are big customers of ours who are using us to personalize uh, viewers' uh, experience on the TV, so delivering video-on-demand titles, for example, that they'd be most interested in interacting with them, uh, or personalizing uh, electronic programming guides so you can find what's on TV now quickly and enjoy it as opposed to spending 10 minutes surfing. Hello, I'm uh, Richard Carrier. I'm Senior Vice President for the Americas of Nero. Uh, most of you probably know or have heard of Nero as a uh, burning DVD burning software. Uh, we're a German company that was uh, started about 12 years ago with this product. Now we've evolved our product offering into a full set of uh, digital media tools that let you do uh, and enjoy your media from the media, movie, music, uh, pictures, creation, to editing, to viewing, to sharing. Uh, our suite uh, called uh, the Nero Suite has been sold to over 300 million units so far. Uh, it can be seen as this, the Swiss Army knife of digital media, in a, in a sense. And uh, more and more we're moving, we're leveraging uh, all these core engines and technologies that we developed to uh, become an enabler of what we call liquid media, which is the ability for people to enjoy any content anywhere, anytime, on any device. So you'll see more and more of us developing uh, new solutions, new products, embedding some of our technologies into uh, hardware to enable this uh, liquid media revolution. Now, uh, Richard and Topher are also Canadian, so we have our international representation here in our, in our panel also when we want to find out what other people think. Huh? <laughs> so um, 
you know, this, this topic, embracing the personalized consumer, uh, I mean, it spans a very wide uh, he uh, audience here and a very wide set of subjects that we could uh, talk about. So what I thought I'd do in trying to, to organize this, and we, we kind of talked about this, was to, uh, to start with, uh, with the consumer and say, uh, what does it mean to, for this personalized consumer? What, what do they really want? And how do we explore what the needs and wants and, and uh, drivers of this uh, really are? You know, we all make assumptions, and I think in the keynotes, we've had a number of examples of, um, of, uh, of, of things that we need to do to, to not to challenge those assumptions that we uh, have there. The second thing we wanted to explore was uh, how are we going to make money in here? So what are the business models that are emerging in this, uh, this world? And then finally, we'll talk about technology. What are the technology enablers? What are the disablers? What are the gaps that we have in the, in the marketplace that are there? So we got a great panel here. We got a lot of different uh, points of view, and um, you know. Uh, so let's get started here with the uh, with the consumer. You know, when you read the just the, the description of this, it said you know the consumer wants to be able to move their media from the home to the workplace to the mobile environment, and there's kind of always this uh, this idea that they would do that. Uh, you know, I've always kind of wondered about that. You know, you're watching Lost and you want to jump out and go watch it on your car or your TV, you know, as you move along. I, I mean, not be interrupted or, you know, so what, what does this really mean uh, and what is the consumer really uh, looking for in this, uh, this world? So we thought we'd start with the market research uh, lead here. And uh, Debbie, if you kind of share any thoughts you have there and then we'll ask everyone else to pile on as they need. Um, well, we've done a lot of research on what consumers are doing, and, and we buy a lot of research on, on what they're doing and thinking and, and what they want. And um, consumers have been embracing technology um, probably a little bit more slowly than we've been inventing technology, uh, and uh, a, a lot of that is um, familiarity. And one of the things we know in research is that people have a very hard time accurately telling you what they're going to be doing in the future. What they can do is tell you what they like today, that exists today. They can tell you what they've done in the past. And I think the best direction in, in looking at what they're going to be doing is to take a look at what they've done in the past and what they're doing today. Um, now, that being said, uh, we've seen that consumers have, have really embraced um, the whole aspect of video and video everywhere. And uh, we know they're, they're watching TV, um, TV type programs in a variety of devices. They're watching it on their set. Um, they're watching it on the computer. Uh, in fact, we, did, we do a, a study, an annual study about, um, and where we ask a lot of questions. And one of them is, where are you watching video? And we saw within a period of one year, the percent of people who said they were watching video of some kind on their computer doubled. And we will be doing that study again in, in a couple of months, and I expect it to double again. Um, they're also watching video on, on um, PCPs, um, a little bit on the cell phone, although um, with the exception of the iPod or the iPhone, the, the cell phone isn't a really great vehicle for watching video. Um, but getting to your portability question, I think people do want um, to be able to do things not only when they want, but also where they want. And so uh, having uh, mobile access to things is also important. Maybe I'll add on with a little bit of the additional consumer research that I think uh, speaks to the, the title of the, uh, of, of the seminar here, and that is uh, the, you know, the per embracing the personalized consumer. You know, obviously, uh, like most vendors who do their own market research, we certainly have self-interest in doing this. Um, but what was core for us in the study that we did a couple months ago was finding out just how many users or customers out there want personalized content. And unsurprisingly, it's a large number. Three quarters of users want and need personalized content. I think what's interesting, though, is the that is a demand that is largely unsatisfied right now, particularly in the media and entertainment world. I think there is a good number of examples uh, online where there actually is quite a personalized experience that is delivered. But if you start looking at things uh, like the set-top or the mobile phone, the level of personalization falls off pretty dramatically there. 
Yeah, as a yeah, uh, just speaking as a consumer, I, I've got a interface uh, into uh, on my TV set that's very similar to the one that I had a decade ago. And there's very little personalization. There's very, I mean, there's a lot of data that is able to be gathered about me, mm -hmm. but that hasn't manifested itself in a particularly interesting and personalized user experience when I turn on my TV set. Um, so I think that's a uh, that that's an area for some some real improvement. And if we're really trying to embrace this personalized consumer, that I think is one of the uh, one of the frontiers where we've got plenty of progress yet to make. Let me let me weigh in here, if I may, on this topic. I think it's fascinating. Debbie, Debbie mentioned a moment ago that consumers are adopting technology at a slower rate, perhaps than uh, would have been anticipated. I was uh, reminded earlier this week of how hard it is to change consumer behavior. I had the privilege of uh, hearing Chip Perry speak. Chip Perry is the CEO of uh, Autotrader.com. If any of you all have use that site, it's the by far and away the largest used car auction or buy and sell marketplace um, available today, $500 million in revenue, very successful company. He said that 10 years ago, 80 to 90 percent um, of, of uh, car buyers, uh, uh, even after researching cars on the web, would go to the dealer to buy the car. They wouldn't negotiate the deal online. So 10 years after tremendous penetration of broadband, 10 years after the advent of social networking and, and, and a much higher connected lifestyle among many, many people, what is it today? 80 to 90% still go to the dealer. And so the point is that consumer behavior is very, very difficult to change. And one thing I'd a offer um, to wrap up is that um, a balanced approach is vital, in my opinion. Uh, we are working very hard to embrace the, the personalization that the toppers is, is speaking to, obviously in collaboration with our service provider customers. Uh, but at the same time, there are existing businesses that are, are real, are delivering real cash flow today, and so forth and so on. And one thing that I find really interesting is that um, with all the excitement about um, online video advertising, with all the excitement about um, transactions around video online with all the excitement about subscription services of video online they constitute a trivial percentage of the total spend if you add up what's viewed on the TV uh, in terms of subscription advertising transaction revenues versus um, what's uh, viewed on the PC it's 99 to 1 now what's even more interesting is if you assign astronomical growth rates to those PC based services let's say 60% a year and very pedestrian growth rates to that which is on the TV and you fast forward it five years guess what it's still pretty trivial okay and so my point in all that is to say we need to make sure that that the existing business is addressed successfully and managed successfully and so forth as we go through this transition so yeah, I'll just, uh, I don't have a lot to add, but I'll say that I would agree with that in that we found in the, in, the, in the cable business, for instance, that you have to take baby steps with the consumers. If you uh, throw a brand new application or, or something that's uh, an, a, a significant change, there's like a, there's a revolt. Uh, it took a very long time to train people to use a, an interactive program guide. And today, the interactive program guide is the biggest interact is still the biggest interactive TV application out there after 10 years of hype of interactive TV. Uh, and we've put things in like favorites and try to get people to uh, basically rate themselves on what they like to watch. And that's still a very um, a sparsely used part of the guide in terms of people bothering with you know they so it, it's not it's it's there but and people want it when they're asked. But in practice, they go back to the, I'm going to sit back, I'm going to surf, and I'm going to, uh, you know, and I'm going to watch the way TV the way I've been watching it for the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. So it has to be very slow, very calculated steps in order to introduce the consumer to new technology. Yeah, well, a big, a big reason for that is that people like simplicity. Mm -hmm. They don't want things that are too hard to do. They... And they, and they worry about things breaking, too. If it's complicated to use, it's probably going to break more quickly. And then that's a mindset a lot of consumers have. So you do need to introduce things slowly and give good, um, simple, make it simple and give consumers good reasons to mm -hmm. want it. Well, I'll agree with that. And then uh, I don't know if John had the same experience, but at the beginning of digital, uh, digital cable, 
uh, the churn rate of people uh, basically canceling digital cable was primarily because they couldn't figure out how to use the guide. And at that point, the guide was pretty simple. There weren't all these advanced features. They just couldn't get it. We s then we spent a lot of money on uh, basically a channel that taught them how to use the guide and, and more, more things like that. So, and it's a big step to a lot of these complicated downloads and y use cases for watching TV on your, um, on your mobile device. It has to be made a lot simpler than it is today. Today you'll get the, the absolute fringe user, the, the, uh, the, the techno geek who can really uh, make it work on his own, you know, on his own. So I think it's, um, it's dangerous, though, to sort of loop, to lump everybody together and say, uh, uh, gee, the existing customer base or the consumer is going to move uh, slowly, right? Uh, I, and, and I think it's particularly dangerous for, uh, for businesses who have a traditional business and need to think about new businesses, and those new businesses may have all the uh, growth rates. Mm -hmm. So that leads you to segmentation. So have you all seen anything uh, that impressed you in segmentation in this, uh, in this arena other than, uh, and in fact we heard uh, Les talk this morning about the, the fallacy of the 18 to 34 year old segment uh, per se, but have you all seen any segmentation you thought was uh, particularly good in uh, kind of trying to separate what the critical patterns are here? Well, I. Uh, I've seen, you know, I've seen reports, I think it was from, the, from Gartner Group or what have you, uh, that basically reinforces the fact that these, this new group called the Millennials, I think they're called, which is the, you know, the 20 to 35 year olds, uh, show incredibly uh, more likelihood of adapting mobile video, watching something on their phone, than the groups that come after that. It falls off uh, fairly significantly, which, uh, as Les said this morning, is, is the inverse to the way people pay. So, yeah, the group that's adopting the fastest does, does not have, uh, is not where the advertisers, uh, you know, are spending their money yet. So to your point, you have to be careful to write them off as a group because someday they'll be 40 to 60 year olds as well. So, uh, but, but there's a lot, of, a lot of research that reinforces uh, their propensity to do things differently, to, to not be afraid of the technology, to, you know, to quickly adapt new things. Uh, I know I'm afraid to upgrade to um, you know, Windows Service Pack 2 for a fear I'll never get my PC back again. But, uh, but others just download it and say, oh yeah, I'll just download it, no problem. So you know, you know, I think that, that speaks to what, what's going on there. Segmentation studies. There was some recent work published by CTAM that looked at a, a, a segmentation scheme. And uh, from from what I've seen, you have your classic bell curve distribution. You've got 10% early adopters and 80% middle market, and then 10% laggards. I mean, it doesn't matter in a sense how you label the categories. They all just seem to fall out onto that same bell curve. You know, go figure. But the the two things that I would offer uh, in the context of segmentation, which I think are pretty interesting, is that there are a couple of universal truths, I think, that, that can be safely said. One is there are infinitely more uh, connected devices today than there used to be. I mean, Forrester published some research that said in um, 2001, there were 300 million devices, roughly. What their methodology was, I don't know. But 300 million devices, I'm sure they counted every one, um, connected to the internet. And their projection is that in, in um, 2012, there will be 14 billion devices connected to the internet. And in many respects, you know, that, that is not too, beyond, too, too far beyond the, the realm of reason. If you just look at the volume of PCs sold each year, the volume of, of uh, web-enabled cell phones sold each year, et cetera, et cetera, um, gaming devices. And so the, the punchline is that that is a, that is a uh, superordinate reality in as far as segmentation is concerned that everybody is much more connected today and will be much more connected in the future. That's one thing. The second thing I'd say is, is there is no denying the power of the bundle. Everybody likes to the, the, the basic principle of buy more, pay less. Okay, With the bundle, service providers are rolling out video voice and data services, and it's working, and it's working extremely well. In fact, I think uh, just yesterday, um, Patricia of um, Cablevision said that 55% of their subscribers get the full triple play. 
And when they get the full triple play, they use all the services more than they would if they only got two out of the three and so forth. So there's a fascinating combinatory effect. What we're moving toward, of course, is you know, not buy more, pay less, but buy more, get more. And that's where I think it's going to get really interesting. I think there's some real pernicious, perhaps unintentional, but I suspect intentional side effects of all these bundle deals, though, and that is the increased switching costs for consumers. I have a very, you know, personal experience with this in that, you know, I've got a two-year contract with my provider who sends TV, phone, uh, and broadband into the house. And I would love nothing more than to switch and uh, go with a one of the new generation of TV providers. But doing so requires me to break a contract and start to unbundle. And if I want to com switch completely, I have some real email portability challenges uh, for my wife's business who has her email provided by the cable provider. So I think the increased consumer switching costs insulate some of these bundled service providers from some competitive market forces that might otherwise make them a little more receptive to consumer feedback and uh, you know changing some of the things that are less than market leading with the services they have. So let me uh, do one more question in the kind of consumer arena and I'm going to follow up Topher with your, your comment where you said three quarters want this uh, personalized content. Um, you know, when we've seen the kind of uh, some of the pushback on, on Facebook and, and personalization, so where do you think the limits of that uh, are? What are the critical uh, elements of, that, of those limitations? Yeah, I mean, I think privacy has the potential to be the third rail of a lot of this, uh, this, this personalized world. Now, th there's an interesting poll that came out a couple days ago from uh, Harris Interactive where 95% of people said they thought it was at least somewhat important for the companies that they deal with to know something about their personal history, you know, who they are, what my buying history is, what my you know, history of uh, complaints with the service may have been, for example. Um, you know, that, that, that's an aspect of the kind of information we can know about consumers. But as we all saw with the whole Facebook Beacon Initiative, um, when you don't give consumers control uh, over some of the information that they're sharing, uh, you can get a very adverse reaction very, very quickly. Um, I, one of the things I did before in, in getting ready for the panel was do a little bit of uh, looking at uh, online privacy standards and uh, surprised to find that there's very little. I think Google made some interesting proposals at the UN uh, back in September, uh, but by and large, certainly in North America, um, the privacy standards are, are, are not very strong. It's really a, a, a smattering of, uh, of, of jurisdiction, overlapping jurisdictions and you know, state by state and company by company privacy policies in many places, and there's there's a very broad spectrum of, uh, of, uh, of of privacy standards that are out there right now, and I think there's probably got to be some sort of initiative that goes on over the next couple of years where we start to have more common standards around what is acceptable information to gather and what are the acceptable uses of that information, because that I think has the potential to really undermine this whole networked and potentially personalized you know, media consuming experience that I think most of us on the panel here would certainly like to see come to fruition. I, th I think when consumers talk about privacy and complain about things like the, the Facebook problem, um, there, there's two sides to this issue, or two sides to their, to their thinking. What they objected to on Facebook was not that Facebook had the information, but the fact that Facebook was going behind their backs is, I mean, basically the way they saw it, and providing information about them to other people that they were not approving. Mm -hmm. But if you take the same people and you ask them about um, getting the recommendations from Amazon.com on a regular basis, they love that. So if it's, if it's a case where it's something that they've opted into, where they're saying, you know, I, yes, I'd, I'd like suggestions, I'd like help, I'd like information, that's fine. It's when the companies disseminate that information outside of them, I think that's where we run into trouble. A couple of things to add along these lines. Uh, there's, no, there's no question that um, privacy standards are requisite for the future that everyone, you know, likes to anticipate, um, a, a world of personalization, a, a world of uh, clear relevance. Um, just came from a, a session this morning about reinventing television and heard that 60% of the advertisements uh, uh, embedded in video that is stored on a DVR are fast forwarded. That's because they're irrelevant. I don't need an advertisement on diapers, for example. Okay, I'm going to fast forward through it. If those advertisements were relevant based on favorable demographics and so forth and so on, people are much more likely to watch those advertisements. Um, I think that as far as um, 
um, privacy concerns um, uh, are considered. I think it's very important to underscore there is a Cable Privacy Act. You know, the MSOs are slavishly committed to following the letter of the law and, and, and do so. Um, certainly there's a level of communication and comfort that needs to be realized before more and more of these applications can be deployed and embraced, but I think there is a, at least a, a foundation that's in place that will enable uh, the, um, the need for the service provider to deliver more personalized services to the consumer and frankly for the consumer to benefit from a much more customized experience. There has to be a sharing of that data and a level of abstraction that ensures that consumers anonymity. That's what people want. I don't care if people know, th you know my age and, and uh, where I live and my interests as long as I'm bundled with a whole bunch of other people you know, just like me. But you know, I wouldn't rather have them know precisely what I'm doing at every minute of every day and know it you know, down to my street address. So it's all about, um, I'll just say, aggregation at levels where anonymity is, is ensured. I think that's, that's what's important. It's also important though, to make sure that those standards move beyond just the cable industry. So mm. as you move into this much more broader online connected world, there's a lot of people who've Absolutely. got access to your data. And I think what consumers at the end of the day really want is not to have to worry about this. They don't want to have to care and believe that there could be some problems out there. Absolutely. And the consistent standards that would go beyond just the cable industry, I think, would be an important step forward. Yeah, yeah we're going to we're going to come back to standards, I think, when we get into uh, technology. But so, Richard, you uh, you said your company had done what 300 million burners or or whatever. So, is, there, is you know, is that a limitation on the uh, <laughs> on customer behavior? That's uh, are there some limitations there we should be watching? Well, Obviously, well, depending yeah, on who you're no, talking. He, Hearing the, the past few comments, uh, one thing that we've seen is with uh, our user base is uh, to uh, gain the ability to uh, interact with them, to personalize their experience, to gather information. It's very, very important to uh, sell them on the value and the benefits of it before they even sign up, and then yes, they need to opt in. Uh, it's very easy for, for software to uh, force people to register into your database, and then you... Uh, you, you can uh, personalize on their back and do all sorts of nasty things if you'd like, but if you do that, guess what? Uh, they, 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 will, uh, they, they will not react uh, in a proper fashion, and uh, if you want to leverage this into either monetization with more services or software or just interaction, they will just drop out. But if you're able to explain upfront the value, and some, some companies are very good at doing that, some of our competitors are very good at doing that, and, and then from there you have, you have this interaction, uh, the, the the positive reaction will have at least an order, if not two order of magnitudes of uh, positive uh, response to that personalization, to that interaction, and we've seen that. If I, if I could, I don't know if it's just legal for, for me to ask another panelist. Absolutely, <laughs> please. <laughs> okay. They, they don't have to answer it, though. They don't have to answer it. <laughs> no, I want that rule that they have to answer um, This is for Debbie. Uh, you talked about uh, the fact, you know, that you're you're involved with uh, research for advertising or advertising research, and surely you you have to be asleep to know that uh, targeted advertising is sort of the big thing that's coming. Mm -hmm. The the cable MSOs have formed the consortium called Canoe, and you, you hear all about it. Targeted advertising. How how does that happen without a lot of knowledge about uh, individuals? Well, at the moment, the way a lot of it is working is on a more aggregated level where they, they know things um, about you demographically, and um, there's, there are databases that do have aggregated information that gets down to individuals. You go through them to get to, to an individual. So if I'm, um, if I'm the cable company, I don't necessarily, or, or if I'm going to the cable company, the cable company is not giving me your information personally. The cable company is using an aggregator so I can say, here's the advertising that I want to get to a consumer with this kind of profile. The aggregator finds the people with the profile and then gets it through the cable company. So I never personal, my company never has access to your personal details. How did the aggregator get the information? Um, they, they can, yeah, I mean they can collect they can collect, depending on what the information is, they can collect the, the viewing information through the set-top box. Um, there are services like Axiom, like Experian, mm -hmm. that have massive databases. I mean, 
if you actually went out there and looked at what is known about you, and not even talking about what's been available technologically for the last 10 years. I mean, these services like Axiom and Experian have been around for a long time, and they know an awful lot about every single one of you. So it's been there, and, and, and your uh, information from credit cards, a lot of that stuff is out there and available, but it's not available to me as an advertiser, it's available through an aggregator who maintains your anonymity, but who's able to allow um, me to target you. And it's complicated. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's switch a little bit and sort of go to the uh, to the business model uh, question. And uh, I thought we had a couple, you know, very interesting comments. And once again, from our keynotes, you know, um, um, you know, Bob Iger talked about, uh, you know, that that uh, we need to embrace technology and media companies need to, uh, to use it or pay attention to it in terms of what it enables the consumer to do and to follow the consumer in their technology uh, moves. Um, and then, and then uh, this morning, Les talked about it. Uh, in fact, I think both of them did, that they v they're viewing very positively this digital space because it looks like it's all additive into the, uh, to the marketplace. They're not seeing the you know, the, uh, the, the bleed that the music companies did. But, um, so let's talk about the business models and we'll try to keep it in this space of uh, across the uh, platforms we have here. But, um, you know, is, the, is advertising the business model that's going to, uh, to drive this? Um, is what's, what is the, what are the other business models that are there? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll okay. Get up go ahead, John. Um, well, advertising is without question hugely significant. I mean, just to get to the numbers, it's n nominally, you're talking North America, um, television advertising is about a $70 billion business. The subscription video business is about a $60 billion business if you add up the, the monthly charges of uh, a cable MSO, uh, DirecTV, EchoStar, uh, obviously now Verizon and AT&T. Um, that's about a $60 um, billion business. And then, DVD sales and rentals is another 25 to $30 billion. So you're talking about $150 billion business spent on video, viewed on the television any given year. Advertising is the largest of those three categories. Um, you have the advent of Hulu even today as an ad model. Um, so there's no question that advertising is going to be, is now and will be for a long time, a very compelling business model uh, for these companies. But I think that there will not be any one model that, that uh, is super dominant. I think you're gonna see hybrids. Um, you have DirecTV, for example. They're um, uh, pr principally a subscription video service they just announced today and, and it was covered in the Wall Street Journal. Their VOD platform that they're gonna be launching in Q2. So there you complement the subscription service with a transaction service. They're also collaborating with uh, TiVo and others on advertising models. and so. Any way that you can get multiple bites at the apple, you're gonna you're gonna go for it. Um, it's just uh, the the challenge of profitable growth will inevitably lead companies to pursue lots of different business models. Right. Yeah, I think it, yeah the it it's moving forward now, as we've said earlier. It's changing to relevant advertising. So mm -hmm. it's going from the mass market advertising and they're just like the device the content is being fine tuned like VOD and things like that. Uh, then the advertising is being fine-tuned especially uh, and then made adaptable to the different devices. So uh, during uh, an ESPN clip, you'll see a different ad uh, on, on your TV than you would on your mobile phone if you, uh, for, for Vcast or something like that. So uh, the people are very uh, cognizant of the fact that the advertising has to be relevant not only to the person but also to, to the device that the content is being consumed on. To pick up on that, one of the elements of the, the survey work that we did recently asked consumers how much more interest they'd be um, uh, willing to pay attention to ads if they were truly personalized, and uh, we found on average 40 percent, 40 percent of consumers were more willing to pay attention to ads if they were personalized. I think that's uh, an irresistible temptation for uh, a lot of people who want to be out there selling ad space to figure out how are we going to better target, uh, target that inventory to users who are more likely to act on it. Now, there's actually the fact that there's true consumer desire to, to receive that product, and by virtue of consuming that product, they make money for the people who are providing the space. 
So yeah, it's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's, it's a win-win all around. So that's quite a challenge, though, for uh, media companies or some media companies that have been used to uh, broadcasting across to an undisclosed uh, group out there or that have been doing movies to, uh, you know, 3,000 theaters with no idea of who's on the other uh, end. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, change that has to require, be required inside these uh, companies to address that, right? I think so. I mean, I, I think the, the ads we see today are more and more targeted, but there's pretty little personalization of sure. the ads that are happening right now. I mean, we're slicing and dicing audiences finer and finer, but we still deliver fairly standardized uh, messaging and content and promotions and offers to those, th those, those segments. Uh, the ability to actually get it really down to a one-to-one -one, uh, sort of ad type approach where, you know, if you're uh, browsing for a particular item on a, uh, on, a, on a particular site on one day, you'll start to see banner ads placed with that same, same item when you're on third-party sites later on. I think it's something that you know, will be certainly very interesting for a lot of the advertisers. I think there's open questions about how excited consumers are going to be to see that. So when Choice Stream goes in and, and offers uh, video personalization, or, uh, do, you have a, do you have a good consumer? I mean, what's the status of the companies when you go in there, and what do you have to build for them and to help enable that? Yeah, I mean, by and large, the sort of information that we use to do personalization is information that our um, you know, video customers are already gathering. You know, there's a certain amount of demographic profile stuff that can be quite helpful to initially provide good quality recommendations. But really, over time, it's what you end up clicking on, what you end up rating positively, what you don't click on, or what you rate negatively. Those are sort of the, the core inputs that end up going into the algorithmic magic that uh, ultimately ends up resulting in uh, more and more accurate predictions of what you're going to like and more and more on-target recommendations. So for, for, for virtually every customer we work with, the kind of information we need to, to power the recommendations that we do is entirely consistent with uh, the privacy policy. And in fact, you know, we've, we've not run into a privacy policy that was restrictive uh, in the, uh, that actually got in the way of us gathering the data we need to to make the recommendations we do. So I said we'd uh, encourage questions as we go along. We have any uh, questions for so far? Yep. Dr. Just talked about what you were here about. What would be the mechanism that we're diverse with now in the marketing business that would translate the information being that individual as generally aesthetic mm -hmm. and then being translated into um, unique data that people are going to want to tell you about um, and also like the connection of people and family and different people and generations. But we have people like Sean Warner Cable who have been completely prolific at this. So I was wondering if you might have any tips or thoughts on how women have that good start to have to build that up and to give them the platform to do this. That is a great question. And that's why we went to the audience. Yeah. <laughs> no, and that's not just a stalling technique. I'm telling you, that is a great, great question. We've thought about that as well. I mean, you think about the power of a service provider to divine the thinking of a, of a set of, uh, of their subscribers, a set of consumers. When you combine the high-speed data network and what people are searching for, you know, Caribbean vacations and what they're watching, I mean, your ability to address the needs of that consumer is unmatched. It's remarkable. And so, uh, uh, I mean, certainly the infrastructure is in place to do that. There's obviously a ton of systems and software work that needs to be done. And then there's a whole other issue of bringing the world of, of the PC into the TV um, from a video viewing experience. Um, but the bottom line is that the world that you envision is entirely possible. It's just a matter of time before those um, capabilities are fully fully um, uh, developed and, uh, and deployed and monetized. Um, and I'll and I, I don't think it matters where the viewing experience is taking place. You've got a unique IP address, right. you know, and you've got a unique, in, in, in the uh, cable modem, you've got a unique IP address in the, in the, in the set-top box. Right. This is hugely valuable, by the way. I mean, consider, consider any MSO, fill in the blank. And uh, let's say that um, you're rolling out voice service, and so you're, you're, you're advertising your voice service. Well, you cer certainly want to know to whom you deliver your uh, six months at $10 a month 
because you don't want to deliver that message to someone who's already getting your, your, uh, your voice service, right? So your ability to discriminate you know, who already has your voice service and not send that advertisement to them, but rather send it to their neighbor who doesn't have your voice service is hugely valuable. Likewise, let's say if you knew that, um, um, a get that, that the prospect of a customer churning out of your system dropped by 50% if they watched two or more video on demand um, uh, episodes a month. Let's say that there was a threshold and statistically you could be confident that you were gonna keep that subscriber for years longer if they had that pattern of behavior. Well, certainly you'd wanna deliver advertising to that consumer who's watching two but not yet three. You see what I mean? And so that level of um, addressability is hugely powerful to the service provider, even within their own domain. I mean, here we're talking about benefits that would accrue to the service provider as opposed to benefits that they would offer and sell to advertising partners. So uh, I think your, your question is spot on and very exciting. Yeah, yeah. And, and also I just wanted to follow up on that. It, there's another layer of complexity that your question brings up and that's who in the house is watching the TV. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've been experimenting with a lot of issues on recognizing presence because if some advertiser thinks that uh, you're so, you know, it, it's, the, it's the teenager that's watching versus the, the adult, uh, the ad is also gonna be not relevant if they don't know who's watching. So now you, do you have to register and log on to your TV? So it, it becomes interesting. We've, finger yeah, finger. <laughs> we've been experimenting with um, Bluetooth where, uh, where your phone uh, tells the, tells the set-top who you are, uh, mainly because the, the 18 to 30 year olds no, go nowhere without a phone. So you could at least tell who was there. Maybe you can't tell who's not there, but you know. Mm -hmm. it, so we're experimenting with all these different kinds of techniques because in the age of personalization versus just demographic you know, uh, narrowing, you get these issues of, you know, of who's watching and where did the information come from. So it gets even more complicated uh, you know, than you first let on. Yeah, and I think that's been a real challenge in media research. I mean, when we, we have techniques like Nielsen's people meter where people push a button and they've obviously looked at other kinds of more sophisticated ways of doing that or uh, net ratings or a comm score where you actually log into the computer so the computer knows who's going where, what they're doing. Um, this becomes a very difficult problem if you're trying to do a, a census kind of mm -hmm. account because you're not gonna get 100% participation in something like this. It also starts to become cost prohibitive to collect data that way. Um, there are companies that have been um, forming algorithms. If a household is viewing a certain kind of program, using a certain kind of website, well, we know that this program or this website <coughs> appeals to these particular groups. We know, or this demographic group, we know the demographic composition of the family, we then make an assumption about who's viewing. It's, it's not perfect. Um, there will be better ways, I'm, I'm sure, down the road. I'm, I'm sure that a lot of these will be overcome if, over time. So I've been up here asking all these questions going along, and then we get the first question from the audience, and John goes, now that's a good question. <laughs> don't take it personally. It's a little insensitive, but obviously we should take more from the audience here. So <laughs>
So why don't I suggest we separate this a little bit too and take a cable view and an over the top or broadband view because I think they're going to be very so different. I couldn't hear the question. Um, um, okay, so the question was, was sorry. <laughs> the question was, um, and you can correct me, but what are the real inhibitors to get into this personalization? We keep talking about how getting, getting really targeted is important, but she, uh, she was on a number of panels and they were talking about how far away interactive TV really is and being able to respond. So she was saying what was the, um, the inhibitors? So what I'd like to do is kind of, um, you know, maybe ask Marty you to talk about kind of from a cable, uh, an MSO uh, standpoint, what are the uh, inhibitors uh, from that? And then maybe um, um, we can talk about the, uh, the view from a broadband standpoint, okay? Marty and John, you could probably both talk about sure. the cable side. Well, if, I, if ITV means interactive TV versus internet TV, but I guess it means, it means interactive TV in your case. Um, the, uh, the, uh, I guess the real, uh, one, of the, one of the real inhibitors um, you know, is sort of the, the one screen versus two screen paradigm. A lot of the interactive, quote, TV has grown up on the PC because it's such a good interactive environment. You can get so much information and feedback between the user using a keyboard and a mouse and a rich environment. And it's not why, and then we, when you're on TV, it's how do you move that over to the TV and provide the same kind of, uh, of interaction. And it's been very hard uh, to figure that out. So it, it's, for instance, a no, from a logical standpoint, just from a design standpoint, technically you could you could you could probably do it very quickly. We have interactive uh, demos where we have a wireless keyboard and a smart remote, but it, it's it's too cumbersome for people to use. Uh, just a, a little thing about uh, interactive TV, where you're being asked questions or you're doing uh, chatting with a few a bunch of people who are watching the same show. Uh, the the uh, application came up is a good one for a sporting event where you have, a, you have your little group of people who like to watch the same sport, sporting event and you want to talk to them or chat interactively while you're watching the game. And it was great while you were on the PC doing that and watching the game. When you come over to the TV and you try to put them together as an interactive application, no one knows on that channel where the scores are. Are they on the bottom? Are they on the top? What do you, are you going to overwrite the scores? With, with, the, with the interaction, you give the person a button to move it up and then you're in the middle of the field. And you know, So just trying to track that one thing, it leads to a lot of problems that you have trying to develop a one screen interactive experience versus when you had the luxury of having a two screen experience, one of which one screen was your PC. So it's, it's not a technical problem, it's really a use case or a you know, a, a user interface problem, I guess, trying to do what, do something with a remote that you're used to doing with a, with a keyboard and a mouse and managing that single piece of late real estate uh, called a TV screen. John, you want to My opinion, that's my opinion. I think it's a matter of will. I mean, uh, you know, if people want, if people see this as enough of a sticky application where it'll keep subscribers from changing, you know, and, and they'll, they'll they'll do it, and you'll you'll get signaling from the sports caster about where my logo is, and there'll be all kinds of protocols that'll be developed just so to make both the TV sm the signal smarter and the a the interactive application uh, basically cognizant of what's going on on the screen using transparency and windows and a whole bunch of different techniques that'll have to evolve, uh, you know, to let the uh, to let the user in. But I don't want to, you know, be. I, I guess I'm the always the gloom and doomsayer on this on the panel. I don't want to. I don't want to get that reputation. There, there's a lot of interactive applications that make a lot of sense, like uh, watching sports from any angle. There's an application where uh, you have your main view and then little mosaics along the bottom of the screen that show different camera angles, or actually even different sporting events. So if you happen to see something happen that you like on one, you just press one button and it swaps the main screen with the mosaic. So if you consider that interactive, then that's, that's the kind of thing that's happening now, things that make sense for the one screen experience, but not merging interactive TV a la the internet directly onto the TV set. 
something that's basically purpose built for interactivity on the TV is more likely to succeed. And that just hasn't, that's again, like my original comment, just slowly. It's not a, you know, let's, let's do interactive TV now and just, you know, slam all this together. It's sort of a slow development of what makes the most sense, what do the people want to watch the most, you know, uh, what interactive uh, application is compelling and so forth. So Topher and Richard, I'm switch. So now let's take the broadband uh, kind of view of this. Uh, is it is it dramatically different in providing these? Um, yeah, I think there are some 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 important differences in the uh, in, in the broadband world. Yeah, I, I think we see the sort of state of personalization online much farther advanced than we do it uh, in the uh, on on the television world. Although just back to back to your your earlier question, I think it'll be. One, to me, one of the, the key milestones about the pace of change that we'll see on, on your TV screen is just how well the AT&T U-verse and the Verizon Fios TV services do. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm interested in your guys' perspective on this, but the extent to which those start really taking a bite out of the traditional MSO franchise and the extent to which the user experience is perceived as an important differentiator that's driving subscriber uptake for those services, which so far has, has been, been pretty good. Um, I suspect that might end up being a major catalyst for faster change with some of the MSOs. Well, it certainly has them uh, doing switch digital video and worrying about more bandwidth. But uh, like John said earlier, I hate to say this, but the, the first uh, the analysis was that it's the bundle that drove the first set of X million or a million subscribers, you know, the attractiveness. And now we'll see how sticky it is when the prices start creeping up and the bundle year ends or whatever. Yeah. Like you're. Like you can't wait for your subscription to end so you could switch. No, right? we're, we're we're there forever because they've got the email address. Oh, okay. You can never switch. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. I think if you if you look at the consumer, in in this issue, consumers watch TV at different times of the day for different reasons. Um, in in the morning, obviously they're getting their news and information. In the evening, they tend to want to watch TV for entertainment, and they tend to want to be relaxed and kind of push back. So. Um, doing a lot of things with the TV set is not what's primary, a, a primary idea in their mind unless it's things like Marty said where you're actually adding value to that TV viewing experience. On the other hand, when they get on their computer, they're getting on the computer specifically to interact. And I think what we're seeing now is a lot more people who have the TV and the computer in the same room and they're watching TV and they're watching TV in a passive mode, but they're on the computer doing things more actively and more interactively. In, in fact, for, for that very reason, I would say uh, I'm much more uh, positive, optimistic about adoption of interactive TV because it is happening on the PC actually uh, today. And it all depends how you define the what is interactive television. Uh, it all def depends also how you define and how you see, how you will connect uh, the PC with the TV watching uh, experience and, a, and, and even the TV feed. And uh, what we're seeing at the moment, I mean, we're, we're working with, uh, well, with, with, with TiVo, not to go into details right now, to, to look at all the, the space. And uh, we found that 70% of households in the US have a uh, TV feed, cable feed or satellite TV feed within 10 feet of a computer. They also are, uh, with the adoption of high definition TV sets, people are more and more comfortable. People understand that you can actually plug your PC to your TV screen because they understand that uh, the days where you, all you had was a, TV, a, a coax cable that you plug in a TV are over. So these, uh, these are triggers where people are being, becoming comfortable to uh, use their computer more and more as an interactive and TV device in the living room. Then when you take uh, on top of that, uh, w when you accept as a uh, content provider that people will go to that open uh, environment, which is the internet, where people really <coughs> interact, then it becomes very easy. I mean, one thing uh, that uh, MSOs have been very good at doing is to create and keep that walled garden environment and try to define what interaction is because their business model depends on keeping users into their environment for ad revenues, among other things. From the moment that uh, you uh, open the door beyond that, you say, you know what, let's, let's not worry about the walled garden. Let's provide application services that people will get freely that, of course, generate different business models, some of which are very different from, uh, from uh, advertising. Then I would say, yes, interactive TV is at our door.
хорошо. Yeah, you can't. We, nobody can hear what you're saying, so. <laughs> Why don't, why don't we move on here to, to <laughs> we had a question back here. So did we, did we hear that question? Okay, all right, great. So, Debbie? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was only going to say very, very briefly, demographic profiling is important. Behavioral profiling is infinitely more important, okay? And so when you know uh, the, the channels people watch, when you know what websites they go to, when you know what they purchase, that's infinitely more valuable to your point than demographics because I'm very different from someone who might satisfy all my um, classic demographic dimensions, I might be way different, you know, behaviorally. So that's where it really matters. And that, frankly, is, is the power uh, that the, the, um, the service provider has at their fingertips. Their viewing behavior, their high-speed data, uh, searching uh, behavior, um, your ability to understand the consumer goes up exponentially and to meet their needs exponentially. Yeah, I think that demographics is better than broadcast and behavioral or personalized is better than demographics. But uh, you're still demographic. I mean, I know the cable operators uh, in LA uh, will send one one commercial uh, to Beverly Hills and a different one to East LA. Uh, I can't say why, but that's what they do, you know. <laughs> but that's demographics. It's just that they know that you know there's th there's a different you know different p people with different economic backgrounds and what have you live in one part or another, which is better than just sending the same ad to everybody, but not as good as knowing that specific family. Uh, you know, likes, you know, uh, you know, a certain item or likes a certain type of wine and this one likes something else. So uh, it's tiered, it's just layered. Yes, sir. Any last say we're there. So the yeah. question was, the question okay. was um, in the last session they talked about creating a uh, API level on the safe top boxes to uh, enable applications to uh, to work on that and how far away is that uh, really is that did I, did I said that right? Mm -hmm. And I think Motorola would like to be known as a set top box <laughs> manufacturer <laughs> also. Uh, that, I, tr right. I tried to say that in my opening remarks it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I have no but we have APIs on the cell phone I can tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Well, the, in the industry years ago launched an initiative called OCAP, Open Cable um, Application Platform. It's now known as True Two Way to, to address the very uh, issue that you, you identify, to essentially um, open up the set top to more and more innovation. Okay? And, um, and so sometimes you'll have uh, third parties all together um, write applications to the set top. Sometimes you'll have the MSOs themselves write their own applications. Sometimes they ask us to do it on their behalf, you know, to their very clear specifications. And so uh, the, the environment uh, that you um, describe is here today. It's not ubiquitous. Obviously, you've got millions upon millions of deployed set top boxes that are not OCAP um, compliant. But those that are being shipped uh, certainly have that, that capability. Would you be willing to swap out the old ones for the new ones and just get the old ones? I would love for them to swap out the old <laughs> ones for the new ones. Because it would be worth <laughs> billions of dollars. Oh, at our cost of people. <laughs> <laughs> Is this an intelligence test? I don't know. No. <laughs> no, I mean, th that's the true two ways, you know, exactly the same answer. And, and the fact that we have the same answer means it's probably ubiquitous as far as the way to interface with the. Um, with the set top. So it is a breakthrough from the, uh, you know, s sort of the proprietary 
uh, operating systems that, that ran around the set-tops for the last 10 years. But now this, the true two-way is, is, is the answer for the, uh, you know, for, to encourage application developers to write for this platform. Are there any examples of applications that have been broadly deployed in that way? Can I try? Um, I know that there are some MSOs that are deploying their own navigator to address some right. of the uh, uh, EPG itemization right. issues. Be because it's such a, a big effort, uh, what's it started by people porting existing applications to be OCAP compliant. So the, the VOD vendors have their client now OCAP compliant. Mm -hmm. So the sea change VOD experience can move easily between Scientific Atlanta and Motorola boxes. But as far as new, I, I don't know about new applications coming in, you'll find that while application developers can do anything they want with true two way the MSOs still are uh, sort of the gatekeepers to what ends up on the set top it's not like the wild wild west where anybody can write anything and it'll end up running on a set top like the PC world it's much more uh, much more controlled is, is that a question of technology because I think it's really important because I did a brief for the set top mm -hmm. just before I left mm -hmm. Bandwidth on the box is kind of an interesting expression. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, Computing but let me power. just say, let me just say, Computing sorry, processing, power. processing power. Processing power, okay. memory. Two, two points to make. I feel really strongly about both of those things. One, we work in collaboration with the service providers, and we deliver products that meet their specifications. If they don't want to pay $500 for a set-top box, they're only going to get so much processing power. They're only going to get so much memory. They're only going to get so much uh, application capability. Okay, there, there's an economic reality that has to be considered. Can we do super whiz bang, you know, <laughs> electric electronic program guides and hyper personalization? Absolutely. How much do you want to pay for it? Is 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 I'll say just a backdrop to this whole discussion. One last thing to point out. We've talked about simplicity as an imperative for consumer adoption. It's got to be easy. We like to use the expression. It should be as easy as using a mirror. You pick it up, it works. Okay, that's how it ought to be. Okay, that is very much at odds with um, a wide open system and an API where anybody can write to it because you know the cooperation that's required for all these corner cases is unbelievable. Give you a perfect example, and then I'll and I'll uh, pass the mic. Uh, everybody celebrates iTunes. They love. You know, the, the high-speed data network combined with the software interface combined with the device, it's a closed system, okay? It's a whole lot easier to deliver a compelling user experience when you own all the pieces and you don't share them with anybody else, okay? But that's at odds with what, you know, service providers want. They want hyper-competition. So where do you find the balance in all that? The marketplace decides. Uh, so right, a little further back there, it's like a guy, you, the light blue shirt. <laughs> well, I, can, I can start with that since I think, you know, we, we've just started to deliver uh, set tops to British Telecom for their uh, Microsoft based uh, IPTV uh, deployment, and they've been doing IPTV for a while over British Telecom. But um, we looked at it, and it's almost like John said, the Xbox is $500. Uh, and for someone to pay, and I'll tell you right now, the other set tops that they're getting are a lot less than that. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of use issues where, you know, if, if, if it's my house, do I want the X, do I want my kid in charge of what, I, you know, what, what they're watching because, well, I gotta, I gotta be down here, it's the Xbox, that's my set top, dad, get out of the house, uh, you know, I'm in charge now. So uh, I think there's a place for that on one of the TVs in the house, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I personally don't think it's gonna be a mainstream, uh, you know, millions of set, t millions of Xboxes used for both gaming and, uh, and the application. So I think the cost is, a gonna, is gonna be an issue and and just use you know usability or you know place for it. Well, 
Right, I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Right, right. It, well, it, it, it backs off into the cost of the service eventually. But, yeah, I think there will be a, there, there would be a number of people who would be willing to buy the Xbox and use it as a set-top. We think that number, you know, is modest compared to the, you know, Joe Six Pack or whatever they call them in the UK. <laughs> so, <laughs> Joe Paul. Williams, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think, again, you know, Apple TV, there's a place for Apple TV, you know, in, in the, you know, in the, uh, I guess the, uh, you, around the set, around the TV, in that sort of uh, environment, in the TV environment. But, and I think, and there's going to be, Netflix has their own uh, set top uh, based on LG, mm -hmm. just to deliver Netflix directly to your TV. But, and they'll, they're all different appliances, and they'll all be purchased at some level. Obviously, we still think that the large portion of the people will consume their, uh, their content via and I would call it, uh, you know, a high-volume, affordable set-top box. One thing I'd add to this question, I think this is a very, very important question, is that uh, people have been uh, calling for uh, the demise of the set-top box for a long time or more competition in the set-top box for a long time. There has been competition in the set-top box industry for a long time. We've had to license core technology to Pace, Pioneer, and Panasonic. The, the, the thing that it's very difficult to communicate but the box is just, frankly, a pretty small piece of the whole equation, all right? It's that which is most visible. It's a significant piece of the CapEx budgets of the MSOs, but it is, it's the tip of the iceberg in many respects in the context of the network, okay? Delivering the video to that set-top box, facilitating all the interactive applications, addressing VOD, addressing HD, formatting video from MPEG-2 to MPEG-4 and SD and HD and on-demand and switch digital video. There's a ton of complexity in the network itself. And typically what we have found is that a purpose-built uh, device does not translate well into the video space, okay? And that's why, despite the caliber of some of these world-class companies like Apple, like Microsoft, um, people repurposing devices into the television space historically has not has not uh, um, generated meaningful uh, market share. And uh, hopefully, um, at least from our perspective, that'll continue, because we, we hope to uh, continue to compete successfully for our customers' businesses. business. So unfortunately, we're running out of time here, but um, you know, I, I promised this group here that if they made, when they get up 50 floors to come see us, mm -hmm. you know, that we'd have something significant to uh, leave with them. So uh, you know, there's, I, I want to ask the panel one final question, which is, um, um, you know, there's been a lot of surprises that have occurred that nobody predicted that would be out there, you know, ringtones being being so successful, and who would have thought that would be a uh, driver, or user-generated content, or social networking popping up. So, you know, all these people want to know what's going to happen in the, uh, the future, so I just want to get from you all your parting wisdom to them on what the surprise thing that's going to happen out there is that that none of them have thought about and they can invest in with you and mm. make their fortune out of. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, let, me, let me offer something. I think this is kind of interesting. I would, I would say um, what you can anticipate is what we're calling visual networking. And it's the um, ex ex extensibility of video into um, social networks and communication networks and so forth. Let me j just give you a very brief example. My son likes robotics. Okay, and a few years ago, he might email with somebody about robotics. Two years ago, he might have emailed and sent digital pictures with robotics. Last week, video clips were being transmitted in the emails. And so if you wanted to reprogram a robot, you just clicked on the video file and then a movie, a, a, a video, if you will, of somebody telling them, here's how the board is laid out, here's where you put the leads and so forth and so on. I think that's what you're gonna see. I think you're gonna see more and more video embedded in our communications. Because let's face it, it's infinitely more engaging. It's infinitely more memorable than text or a still photograph. So I would offer visual networking as that uh, future vision. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll just chime in with something uh, that's sort of controversial for the last couple of years, and that's something called network PVR. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, a set-top can be bought without a disk in it or with a disk to make it work like a TiVo unit. Uh, and then there's the concept of get rid of all the disks that are out there in set-tops and let the service provider have a big disk farm and store all your content for you. Cablevision got into trouble with that with rights and 
uh, now it's being done in the managed with the Time Warner start over mm -hmm. and uh, and some services. But I think they'll I think the content provider the content providers will get over the issue of the uh, of network PVR, support it, and that will open up a tremendous amount of social networking applications like being able to pause a, a program in your house and go down the street and say you got to see this and press play in your neighbor's house because the content's coming from the network, not from the set top. Be able to pause something and go watch it on a portable media player somewhere else or transfer things uh, regardless of where you are. If your content is stored in the network versus being stored in a box under your TV, the number of applications that can spawn from that are, are just almost limitless and I think that will be the surprise that everybody will start falling in line with network PVR and that applications will start to be written and networks will start to support it. I'm, I'm, I'm very much in line with that and I actually thought you know a lot of sort of the, the, the home media center discussion that was um, you know part of the subtext for, uh, for, for the panel here today is something that I think is unlikely to happen if we're requiring people to sort of manage servers and you know storage arrays in their in their home. Now the ability for that to turn into a mass market I think is, uh, is, is negligible. So I think sort of the whole network approach where the complexity is taken out of the hands of the consumer is a critical precursor for broad broad scale adoption. Um, to you know, piggyback on the comment you're making, John, I think the, the sort of the visual networking stuff is something that is really interesting. I think there's a very interesting second order problem that comes out of that around the whole digital search mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you find stuff in a world that is, uh, is, is, is very much video without having to resort to elaborate, uh, elaborate tagging of every single video asset? I guess the last thing uh, I'd offer is to, in the spirit of, you know, are there opportunities to, to make money? I actually think there's a, uh, probably a pretty substantial Web 2.0 shakeout coming. So if any of you can figure out how to short a lot of the Web 2.0 companies out there that are still private, I think there's some good opportunities to make some money there. <laughs> one, one, one thing I, uh, I would say in my end, a lot of discussions around the, the devices, the set-top boxes and video. Uh, I think uh, we should not underestimate the power of the PC and software on the PC. Uh, I'm not saying that just because my business, but uh, <laughs> all the, the issues that we've heard uh, today around uh, power, around uh, user experience, uh, around uh, the ability to uh, connect into a network environment. Well, the PC does all of that today. You have more powerful machines. People are willing to spend the, the $1,000 for a PC much more than they're willing to spend the $500 for, for, for other types of appliances. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you look at, yes, but people don't think of PC to watch TV, but guess what, nowadays, everybody uh, has a PC involved into their music listening experiences. Everybody has uh, the PC involved into uh, their picture taking. People are doing digital pictures. Whether or not it goes into the cloud into, to, to, to be stored in the network or in a PC, uh, what resolves adoption is great user experiences. And uh, that's what we have to work on. So I think the technologies are there. The PC can play a huge part. It's quite easy to connect a TV to a PC that same way that it's easy to connect an MP3 player to a PC today. It's easy to connect a TV feed to a PC. So all these things are, are coming together. Now if you make the user experience simple, if you make it robust, if it doesn't crash all the time, uh, these are things that are about to be resolved and are being resolved today. So that would be my... my uh, my insight. Okay, and my, and my prediction is similar to that. Um, I think it's more of an evolution than a, a dramatic change, but I think we're going to see many more televisions or computers hooked up to televisions, and I think that people are going to be doing a lot more of their TV viewing on their TV set, but coming in through the computer. And this is something in, in advertising, everybody's very nervous about the impact of DVRs and how DVRs are changing people's viewing behaviors. I think where their viewing behaviors are gonna go is to uh, the TV experience via um, the PC or via the internet. Well, I wanna uh, thank our panelists. You guys have been, uh, guys and gals, <laughs> have been terrific. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs>